The following message was preached at Gospel City Church, a church that seeks to cast a gospel net for the people of Kuala Lumpur. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to um, our corporate worship service here at Gospel City Church. We're glad that you all have uh, made it this morning. Uh, my name is Nick. I'm a covenant partner here at Gospel City Church, and it is my uh, privilege, my honor to help us get to know a little bit about Romans before we start the series proper. Um, today we're going to be talking just some introductory matters, maybe help, uh, help us trace through Paul's argument. And I hope you guys are ready because this is a beautiful book. It really is. Um, God, over the past couple weeks, has really just reminded me of how wonderful this book is. Um, a lot of sometimes, I don't, if you're anything like me, you think of the book of Romans and you start shuddering. You start getting afraid. You're like, oh, I, I, this, this book is for people that are like theologically educated with PhDs. That was my thoughts. Those were my thoughts, excuse me, about Romans. For a long time, actually. And then God, God changed my mind. Um, he helped me realize that this book, yes, can be difficult. Yes, can be challenging. But it's written for us. It's written for us to help, him, to help us understand who God is, to help us understand who we are, and how we fit into God's plan for his glory. So before we jump in any farther, let me pray for our time. Let me pray for each and every single one of us that God will um, either awaken or resurrect a love for his word before we jump. In your name, Lord Jesus, you are so good. You're so wonderful. Thank you for this time, Lord. Thank you for gathering us here to study this wonderful treasure trove that is Romans, Father God. I want to pray that over the next couple minutes, you will draw us into your word, Father God. That you will awaken us a deep-seated love and admiration for Jesus, for how you are saving us, how you are gathering us into your people, how you are working mightily in this world to create your, for yourself a people who is wholly devoted to you. Father God, thank you. Be with our time. Give me the words to speak. Give us ears to hear what you have to say. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen. And, and with the, I'm not one of these people, but I know a lot of people who, before they start reading a book, they look at the ending. They look at the conclusion. They want to know if it's a happy story, if it's fiction. If the hero wins at the end, and if they don't, then they don't buy the book or they don't open the book. They want to know the answers to all their questions, maybe even before they ask them. I want us to do that in Romans as we start our time together. I want us all to turn to Romans chapter 16, um, verses 25 through 27. That's on page 72 of the booklet that was just handed out. And I'll read it for us here. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. These are the last words of the book of Romans. It's this beautiful doxology. It's this beautiful praise. 
Paul also in his doxologies, he's known for writing, essentially concluding the book, for writing some of the most essential topics in his writing. Um, I want us to focus here on verse 26, how all of this is happening to bring about the obedience of faith. Well, what does this short little phrase mean? Obedience of faith. Well, um, it means that disobedience to faith is to God, and it's the obedience that we can follow God only through faith. Let me say that again. It's obedience to God that can only be accomplished through faith. This is the concluding word of the book of Romans, or one of the concluding words. Now, if we flip to the first page of Romans 1.5, and I won't ask you to flip there, but if we were to turn there, we would say, we would also see that Paul himself is called to bring people to the same obedience of faith. This is called an inclusio. This is called an inclusio, something that begins a book and ends the same book. And you don't have to know the name. I just think it's really cool. Maybe some of you guys do as well. But what it means is that if a book begins with an idea and ends with the same idea, it means that the entire book is devoted to the idea. The entire book is about the idea. In this case, the entire book of Romans is about calling people to God-centered obedience of faith. See, the plan of God has always been to create a people wholly devoted to him, wholly obedient to him through faith. And so the underlying question that we need to ask ourselves as we get into Romans is how does God bring us to the place of obedience to him? that only faith can produce. How does God bring us to the place of obedience in him that only faith can produce? And the answer is the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. Now we'll, we'll unpack what that means in this sermon series. But the answer lies in the good news of Jesus, who gave his life not just so that we may have life, but that we may have life to the full, as it was always purposed to be. And so the book of Romans tells us the story of how the gospel transforms us into people that can be obedient to God through faith. And how per se does the gospel do this? Well, there's four ways, and it, it creates the different movements of the book. There's four movements in the book, um, one way for every movement, and they build on one another. The gospel takes us from wrath to righteousness, chapters 1 through 4. The gospel takes us from hopeless to hopeful, chapter 5 through 8. The gospel takes us from doubt to trust, chapters 9 through 11. And the gospel takes us from self-centeredness to God-centeredness. Chapters 12 through 16. Takes us, the gospel takes us from wrath to righteousness, from hopeless to hopeful, from doubt to trust, from self-centeredness to God-centeredness. That's why Paul wrote the letter. That's why, as we explore Romans, we'll see 
that his desire is to bring the gospel to Spain, and he wants the people of Romans to support him. That's why he's writing to Romans, to help them overcome some issues between, um, between Jews and Gentiles in the church. That's why he's doing everything in this book. In our time together, we're going to briefly, like I said before, unpack each movement and how the gospel brings us to a place where we can be obedient to God through faith. So let's jump in and let's see what God has to tell us today. Number one, the gospel takes us from wrath to righteousness. So most of you are in the workplace, okay? Most of you have a nine to five job or nine to six job or whatever it is. But I guarantee you, all of you don't like to be called to the, your boss's office. Or at least I don't. Maybe you have a good relationship with your, I, I have a good relationship with my boss. I should be careful to phrase that. <laughs> but I don't like being called into the office because usually um, if there's something up, you know, you sit down and he says, oh, I've got good news. Or she's, I've got good news. You know what's happening next, right? It's like, okay, good news, but we know there's bad news coming, right? If you're anything like me, you just forget the good news. Just tell me the bad news, okay? Um, the bad news or the good news just kind of, I just forget about it. Moving into the bad news. Just let us end our meeting on a good, hopeful note. Well, that's kind of what Paul does in Romans' first movement. He tells us the bad news before he tells us the good news. And the bad news is this. All of humanity is under the wrath of God. All of humanity is under the wrath of God. Wow. Okay, that's a, that's a bold statement. That's a big statement, but that's what Paul's telling us. In Romans chapter 1 and 2, Paul shows us how every single person has rebelled against a holy, perfect God and has sinned against him. The passage then tells us why. Number one, humanity tells us that or, uh, humanity is under wrath because we commit sin against God. We see this in chapter 1, verse 18. It is called godlessness. We, uh, Paul tells us here that God has revealed himself in what kind of God he is through what he has called natural revelation. And what natural revelation is, is we, we look at creation and we see the beauty of creation, but we also look inward and we, we see the sense of justice. We have the sense of mercy, kindness that seems universal throughout creation, throughout, throughout humanity, excuse me. And we, and when there's this inherent correct way of living that is sort of ingrained into us, which is why we can have universal justice, right? And where, wherever you go around the world, we know that things like murder is wrong, right? We can tell what is just and unjust. And that's part of what, is, what Paul is, is describing natural revelation. This natural revelation, justice, mercy, but the world itself and the way it works should lead us all to praise. It should lead us to honor this creator God and to be in turn devoted to him. But you see, instead, humanity has chosen to ignore this natural revelation and is said to devote ourselves to other things but God. A second reason we're under the wrath of God is because we commit godlessness. We commit wickedness against others, all in an attempt to magnify ourselves. In short, all humanity has become trapped by sin, by selfishness. 
we, according to Paul and according to the entire biblical story, we have turned away from God to devote ourselves to created things. Things like wealth, like personal pleasure, like job security, like family. All of those can be good things, but when they become the most important things, when we find ourselves more concerned about those things than about God, than about others, that's not good. That's sin. And God's wrath is kindled against this. But you see, this also means that the Old Testament people of God, the Jews, are included as being people under God's wrath. The Jews were the ones who were supposed to be obedient to God through faith. After all, God made a promise to their ancestor Abraham that he would make from his descendants a great nation, that he would use them to bless the world. God then, out of his love for his people, rescued them from slavery in Egypt, gave them his law that was designed to give them knowledge of God and keep them obedient to him. He gave them prophets to further um, dispense to them God's word and his plans for saving the entire world. And you would think that after God does all this for his people, that they would be obedient to him in faith, right? No. They were just as sinful. They were morally broken, just as wicked as the rest of humanity. They violated God's good law that he gave them, and so too are under God's wrath. We'll spend a lot more time talking about this in Romans chapter 2 verse, and uh, all the way to chapter 3, verse 9. And this is the clicker. This is the clincher. What does God do? And this is the crazy part, because God could have wiped away the entire world. God could have judged his people and every person and condemned them for all eternity. But God doesn't do that. God's purposes were always to make a people who would, through faith and devotion to him, obey him. And so what does he do? He sends Jesus, his own divine son, to rescue us from our predicament. And we see how he does this in chapter 3. In verses 21 through 22 of chapter 3, we see that through Jesus, God's saving power, what Paul calls God's righteousness, is available. Not through the Jewish law or any other law that humans can keep, not through revela natural revelation, but through Jesus. This salvation, according to verse 21, is prophesied in the Old Testament, that one day God would act powerfully to save people from every corner of the earth. This is seen in places like Isaiah 53, like Micah 5, like Zechariah 9, verses 9 through 13, and many other places. In verse 25, we see how this salvation works, how Jesus has become our propitiation, a really long word that basically means that Jesus has become our substitute. How he suffered God's wrath on our behalf and how he died as a result before being raised to new life three days later. We can re read about it, this in detail in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we also see in chapter 3 that through Christ's substitutionary sacrifice, God has forgiven, or as Paul puts it, passed over 
our former sins, that we are no longer held accountable for them. But you see, that's not all that Jesus does here. Through the work of Jesus, our relationship with God that was fractured as a result of sin has been restored. Paul's word for this new status, this new relationship that we have with God is, is righteousness or justify, as the text puts it. God declares us righteous because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And according to verse 26, this salvation is available to all who place their faith in Jesus. That is, whoever believes that Jesus died in their place and, and trusts that and, and devotes themselves to him can be forgiven of their sins and stand righteous before God. That chapter 4 tells us that God's plan from the beginning, that this was God's plan from the beginning, to create a people who would trust and obey him ever since Abraham. Now let's stop and think about this for a minute. God's love for us is so great, it's so powerful, that he would send his son to experience the wrath that we so justly deserve so that we can be forgiven, so that we can stand justified before him. How wonderful is that? How wonderful is it that we can have a relationship with the God of the universe who loved us and gave his son for us. This on itself should lead us to worship. It should lead us to praise. It should lead us to devote ourselves to him. Because the gospel leads us from wrath to righteousness. So the gospel takes us from wrath to righteousness. But you see, the story of Romans does not end there, right? We're only four chapters in. There's 12 more chapters to go. If the gospel ended there, it would be great. It would be wonderful. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That our former sins were forgiven, that we currently have a relationship with God. But this on its own does not make us people who are obedient to faith. Because we're still tempted. We're still tempted by sin. And every second of the day, as we might sing hallelujah, praise the Lord, and then as soon as we step out of this hall, we, we are encountered with trials and temptations that can lead us to sin, that can lead us to disobedience. But the gospel's not finished yet. The gospel is bigger than that. Which brings us to our second movement. The gospel takes us from hopeless to hopeful. A couple of years ago, I tore my rotator cuff and I, I didn't want to, um, but eventually I just sucked it up and had, and had, had to go to physio and you know, I didn't like that. I was kind of humiliating, but it's okay. I've gotten over it. Um, I didn't want to do it, but you know, after the treatment, pain subsided. So it was win-win for everyone. Hospital got my money. I got a good, good shoulder. Win-win. Um, it was like I almost had an all-new arm, brand new arm. Certainly, from the perspective of my previous predicament. And if we think about it, this transformation 
is kind of what Romans 5 through 8 is all about. Because in it, we see God transforming us to be people who can truly obey and be devoted to him. Look with me at Romans 5. Romans 5, in short, replays for us the story of Adam. How, though he had the law of God, the command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he disobeys. He eats the fruit. And through this one act, introduces sin into the world, upon which every human then follows in the footsteps of Adam. Now, we'll talk about this later on in the series. But Paul's, or Adam's disobedience opens the floodgate and allows sin into the world. And we all reap the consequences of that. Paul, later on in chapter 5, then contrasts Adam and his disobedience with Jesus and his obedience on the cross, stating that while Adam failed, Jesus succeeded in his obedience through his death and, his, and was raised to new life. Well, how does this lead us to obedience in the faith? Chapter 6 tells us that for everyone who places their faith in Christ as their Savior has died to sin. That just as Jesus died and was raised to new life, so Christians, in a spiritual way, have died to sin and spiritually raised to new life. Free from the domains of sin. In other words, through God's power, we can wage war against, we can resist sin in a supernatural, God-empowered way. As Romans 6, 10 through 11 says, for the death he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The point is this, that Christians not only experience a resurrected spirit that allows us to resist sin, but we await an even greater physical resurrection, a raising to new life in the new creation, where we will live with God forever living for him, fully devoted to him, just as we were always created to be. Romans 8 builds on this hope that while we cannot yet see it, our future hope of resurrection is certain, regardless of what happens in this life. Romans 8, 37 through 39 says this, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor present, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's good news. That's a good word. It's exciting to read it. Let's recap a little bit here. The gospel transforms us from people hopeless to obey God to hopeful to obey God by transforming us from the inside out. It gives us the freedom to flee from sin through God's saving power. It gives us the assurance that one day we too will rise to new creation in life, just as Jesus did. And so how does this impact us now? How does this lead us to obedience now? It means that we can be devoted to God now because we have this supernatural assurance that God is with us, that he will save us, that he will raise us to new life. 
and that we have nothing to fear when we obey God. Because our greatest enemies, sin, death, have already been defeated. The gospel takes us from hopeless to hopeful. Okay, so the gospel takes us from wrath to righteousness. The gospel takes us from hopeless to hopeful. Let's move to the third movement of Romans. That's chapters 9 through 11. The gospel takes us from doubt to trust. The gospel takes us from doubt to trust. And to intro this movement, I want, us, I want to point you all back to a fairly embarrassing time of my life um, when I was four. Okay, it's not that embarrassing now I'm four. Anyway, um, my, I'm, five, I'm four years older than my sister. Okay, um, so I remember when my sister was born. I also remember that I was super jealous and asked my parents to put her back in the pink. I did not want a sister to share my parents with. I did not trust that my life would be better off with a sister. Now, I love my sister. Um, I'm, I'm thankful for her. She's proven immensely, just immensely helpful and wonderful. Um, but at that point when I was four, I didn't know. I did not trust that what was going to happen was actually for my good. Well, in movement one, we've seen how God, by way of the work of Christ, has justified a people and made them his. We saw how these people have been freed from the bondage of sin and one day will rise to new resurrection life. In movement two, and all of this sounds good, except for one small issue. And actually, it's a pretty big issue. Many of the Jews of Jesus' time did not buy into it. Now, for us, this might seem small, insignificant, but it's actually kind of a big deal. I mean, the Jews were the ones who should know God the best, right? They were the ones who received the law. They were the ones who received the prophets. They were the ones who were supposed to understand God and what he was doing in the world. They should know what God was up to and his plans. And by the time that Paul wrote Romans, not all of them, in fact, a minority of them, had placed their faith in Jesus as their Savior. In fact, God promised Israel that they were his chosen people. And now God is creating this new people? How can God be trustworthy if he seems to go against what he said he would do before? And this is the problem that Romans 9 through 11 tries to tackle. Many scholars have spent their entire lifetimes trying to work through this movement. We'll spend a long time here at Gospel City Church trying to understand it, though not to date. Let me just summarize it here. In chapters 9 through 11, Paul shows how God has always worked this way. He has always worked this way. God has chosen some to be his and others not. For instance, Romans 9, 7 says that God chose Isaac to further the promises he made to Abraham. Not any of Abraham's other sons. The passage then gives another example in Isaac's son, Jacob. Jacob was chosen to carry the promises made to Abraham, not Esau. Paul then takes us back to the story of the Exodus from Egypt as recorded in the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, 
where God rescues Israel by hardening the heart of the king of Egypt. And the point here is, according to Romans 9, 17 through 18, that's page 72 in your Romans copy, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, verse 18, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. God was able to orchestrate events according to his will. That God, as God of all creation, has the right to do this, the ability to do this, to raise up people as he sees fit, and save them and rescue them and incorporate him into this into his people. Okay. Romans eleven then goes on to tell us that at the proper time, everyone who is meant to be saved will be saved. Second, the reason why so many Jews rejected Jesus during the time of Paul is that they thought that their relationship with God was based on their obedience to the law rather than noticing the saving work that God has done through Jesus. That now as always before, salvation was totally and only based on faith in God's salvation. We see this in the Old Testament, like in Isaiah 45, verse 22. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. So God has always operated like this. He has always drawn people in and saved them. And incorporated them into his people. Like I said, these are tough chapters, the most difficult to understand in the book. Scholars have chopped down a bunch of trees to try to understand Romans 9 through 11, and they're not going to stop anytime soon. But by God's grace, we can understand the main message. But in the meantime, we can rest assured that salvation is available to us today based on faith because God has always worked to save people based on faith, their faith in him. He has always worked to save people, but not others. And because this is how God has always acted, we can trust that this is how God acts now through Jesus. That he has, is, and will save his people that are called to him in faith. So the gospel takes us from wrath to righteousness, from hopeless to hopeful, from doubt to trust, and now from self-centeredness to God-centeredness. What does it mean for us to be God-centered? To be wholly devoted, to be wholly obedient to God. And this is where Romans 12 through 16 takes us. Knowing that we are saved by God and because of him free from sin, we, yeah, can be obedient to God. What that looks like is we can love others, including those in the church. Not in a mushy, sappy kind of romantic way, but in a way that seeks their best interests. Because of the death 
and resurrection of Jesus, we no longer have to pursue our own interests because Jesus has secured our life. He's made it possible for us to live out our purpose. The gospel allows us not to judge others. Because God has secured everything for us. The gospel allows us to be obedient to the authorities. Because we know that the ultimate authority lies in God, not in man. And so we, we in obedience to God and in faith, um, we respect them, but we do not fear them. The gospel allows us to live a renewed, transformed life to be on mission to God. That means because of the gospel, we can take this good news to our friends, our colleagues, our family, those we know, to make this good news known to them. That God, through Jesus, has secured for us life and liberty forever if we place our faith in Jesus. The gospel takes us from self-centeredness to God-centeredness because Jesus has done everything for us and we no longer need to fear about getting enough for us. And that's Romans. The gospel takes us from wrath to righteousness. The gospel takes us from hopeless to hopeful, from doubt to trust, from self-centeredness to God-centeredness. And it's all because of Jesus. His life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. And now he calls on all of us to place our faith in that saving act, in that salvation. And it's only through that can we live out our purpose as people who praise God and are wholly devoted to him. That means that we don't stop sinning. That means that we don't struggle with temptation anymore. But it means that the power of God is at work in us through Christ, through the Holy Spirit, to make it so that we can wage war, so that we can be obedient. Let's pray. Do that one. Father God, you are good. Thank you for Romans, this wonderful book. Lord, I want to pray that you will inspire for us a great passion for you, a great devotion for you, because through the gospel, we can fulfill what we were always meant to do. Be de people devoted and obedient to you. Will you help us see the beauty in that? Will you help us resist sin and cling on to the gospel? Will you help us love you more than anything else? And we trust all of this in the wonderful, strong name of Jesus, the one who died and rose and ascended so that we could have life for your glory and our joy. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message. We invite you to learn more about Gospel City Church at gospelcitychurch.com.
www.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai.ai